Alafia, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of Omni U Presents the H3O Art of Life show. I am here for part two of Help Somebody. I have with me Baba Prince, Dr. John F. Price, and Joseph Ben Levy, who is my son and my student. In fact, both of these young men are my sons in spirit. And I always like to have them on the show because we usually have very amicable conversations. We are still concerned with the events that are relevant to the Hurricane Katrina as well as the general welfare of our community. And so we want to begin to talk about preparations because it appears to me that we were not at all prepared for what beset us. And consequently, uh, we have people who are still suffering, who are still displaced, who are still uh, stressed and undergoing all kinds of uncertainty as to what their future will hold. I would like, first of all, to ask Baba Prince to comment on uh, some of the thoughts and feelings he's had over the last week or two. Uh, thank you. Uh, professor, uh, as we uh, look on the TV screens and we see all the people who are suffering down in the Gulf Coast, uh, we come to see that uh, the government, which they place so much confidence and faith in, to a greater or less extent has failed. And um, it is due to the fact that we place too much emphasis and too much confidence in these institutions and uh, we come to find out that they are not what we suspected that they are. Most of the time we find that government and politicians are campaigning and usually what they're doing is giving a lot of what is called jaw service and when the actual effect uh, 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 scenario appears that they become inept. These are the products of bureaucracy, you see. But it is unfortunate that so many people had to lose their lives because of that fact. Uh, it is a known fact through the scientific community that there are global circumstances that are prevailing, that politicians and governmental agencies are not paying due attention to. We have what you call global warming that is taking place. Uh, we have uh, shifting in the uh, magnetic poles, uh, the magnetic field of the earth. All of these factors are playing an important role and how uh, climatic changes are taking place within the uh, global sphere. But uh, I would, wouldn't like to get too far into this. I'd like Ms. Uh, Guru Manji, maybe Professor would like to add something to this, Professor Levy. Well, certainly I want to pass on the microphone to Professor Joseph Ben Levy uh, because I'm certain that he has some very uh, good comments to make around this. I want us all to have an opportunity to make our opening statements as we go deeper into our, in our inspection of these events. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Peace. I'm glad to be here on the show again with you as always and, and to also bring a uh, a historical perspective to uh, this situation. One of the things I'd like to start out by saying is that, the, in, in piggybacking off what Dr. Price has said, you know, this reminds me very much of a, of, a, of the lyrics of a song uh, I heard um, some years ago by War, which uh, says that uh, you rem you remind me of a haunted house I once was in. And this is kind of the situation we find ourselves in. We're kind of in this spooky, scary, haunted house that uh, has all of these uh, false images, ideas, and, and uh, attempts at essentially psychological warfare to scare people. And to look at the historical aspect of this, we see that... Uh, the, the town of the, the city of New Orleans was really named after the French, a French duke by the name who was known as the Duke of Orleans, 
and the Duke of Orleans allowed them to establish the uh, city of New, New Orleans in 1718. During this time, New Orleans was set up as a penal colony. As a penal colony, it essentially was there to, it, to settle beggars, murderers, thieves, prostitutes, uh, and these types of unseemly characters, and it's probably one of the reasons why New Orleans got its, its, its kind of a, sort of almost a sin city name to itself. Um, after three years, these, these uh, uh, vagabonds and criminals would then be allowed to have land and establish themselves in the city of New Orleans. Now, but around, by, by roughly 1746 though, you saw where in the city of New Orleans, the city of New Orleans had a, a population of approximately 4,500 Africans and about 3,200 uh, Europeans, so that the city has always been a majority African city. This has never changed. And you, you find early on that uh, the, the, the city was very much an Africanized city, you know, from the Mardi Gras to uh, the things that went on in what they called the Congo Square, where all the Africans got together to to uh, perpetuate their culture, which is now called Louis Armstrong Park. Uh, and you had a lot of uh, different peoples there. N not only that, when we look at Mississippi, Biloxi, Mississippi was established in 1699 by the French and uh, was also a significant colony that was there for the benefit of bringing in various types of criminals. It was the, initially this, the idea that oh, some people came in there, they saw this was a beautiful place in the swamps, and they built them a city there. The other thing we want to keep in mind that most of the, of the Africans who came to Louisiana came essentially from the Upper Guinea Coast, from Senegal. In fact, in, in, in many cases, the Africans who lived there were called Senegal. That was their name. Uh, they weren't called these types of African Americans. You had uh, various people, the Serer, the Wolof, uh, the Peru. All of these are nations of people that live in the area that today we know as the Senegambia region around Gambia and Senegal. And uh, it's, it's very important that we, we look at the history of this place because it has a great and a glorious history. Uh, and for that reason, I wanted to, to bring in a couple of books out of my library that I have that deal with the history of New Orleans. And one of them I have right here is called The Free People of Color of New Orleans, an introduction uh, by Mary Gaiman. This is a very good book because it goes into some of the history of the, of the Creole nature of that society and what they were all about. And uh, very good reading, very interesting history. Another book I have is called The Africans in Colonial Louisiana, The Development of Afro-Creole Culture in the 18th Century. And this one really goes into the history of it and the author of this book, Gwendolyn Mitlow Hall. Gwendolyn Mitlow Hall wrote this book and it's a very good book because it really goes into a background and, and uh, in-depth understanding of the development of the history and the culture of Louisiana in, uh, in, in the early days. Another one I have here is called Black New Orleans, 1860 to 1880 by John W. Blassingame who's written many, many very good books. And this will give you a really good insight into the nature of African Americans who lived in New Orleans between the, in that 20 year period between 1860 and 1880. Another one I have here uh, by William Kelly is called A Servant of Slaves, The Life of Henriette DeLeo. Uh, Henriette DeLeo was the founder of uh, what they called the DeLeo, the, the, the DeLeo Sisterhood. And it was a group of nuns who were the first uh, black nuns who, to have a society and organization in New Orleans. And interestingly enough, in the French Quarter, if you go to see the place where uh, the, those sisters had their, their convent, right down the street, just a block away, is the white convent where the white nuns existed, but the black nuns were the ones who basically assisted uh, the people in the city and gave them uh, a, a refuge and so forth. So the history, there's a lot of history and a lot of culture in New Orleans that, that one can explore besides just going down there and going down Bourbon Street and drinking because you can drink alcohol on the street. If you go through the place, you see a lot of history and a lot of culture there. Uh, uh, 
uh, Tennessee Williams wrote the book of street, uh, you know, wrote the play a streetcar named Desire. Well, there's actually a streetcar by the name of Desire, and there's actually a streetcar Desire in New Orleans. So th there's a lot of history and culture that Degas has a home there for those people who went to art uh, that that you can see there. Uh, so there's so much history. Uh, that's involved in a place that we need to look at. And of course, it's the birthplace of what we know of as the as uh, as the truly only true American form of music, as they like to call it. And that is jazz, which is a combination of all of the cultural music that we brought to this country uh, in combination with certain other types of cultures, but mostly our culture and all of the great jazz musicians. Uh, you can go back and, and, and the early R&B uh, singers from Fast Domino to Jolly Roll Morton to uh, um, uh, Little Richard. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. Louis Armstrong, all of these individuals who are instrumental in the history and the development of African American music in the early days have their foundations in New Orleans. So it's very important that we not only understand how we need to save this city, but we also need to save the cultural heritage and the legacy that the city has presented, not only for us as African Americans, but to this country and to the world as a whole, because many of these musicians who couldn't make it here in the United States could travel all overseas to Europe and other places and do exceptionally well for themselves. So there's a whole lot that we have to look at in terms of this city, and we don't want to overlook uh, the fact that this is a city that now has basically become depopulated. You got African Americans that they got up in Orem, Utah, in the middle of nowhere, where the population of Utah is less than one percent black, who uh, are, are going to have to make major adjustments because, for one thing, while it gets kind of cool down there in the South, it doesn't snow, and now we're moving people out uh, to other parts of the world. And I'm, I'm, I'll talk a little bit further about that in some more details from the standpoint of slavery and so forth uh, as the program goes on. Thank you very much for that historical overview, uh, Professor Ben Levy. A uh, couple of things that I want to reiterate and reinforce. Uh, one is that it is always important to do an historical overview because if we don't know what we had, we cannot know what we lost. And that's one of the reasons why African history is so important, uh, that very often our people don't recognize that when we lost the majority of the continent of Africa to uh, non-Africans, that we lost valuable resources, not only uh, uh, material resources and human resources, but the cultural resources that we lost and had to reestablish um, by, you know, I suppose by improv improvisation, we were able to reach deep into our cultural DNA and pull back up some of that uh, that was lost. So it's always important to know what you have lost so that you will know what it is you need to restore and actually be able to assess your losses in real terms. The other thing is that it is very important to know that many uh, places in uh, this country, in America, were established as penal colonies and penal colonies, I just want to, to uh, elaborate, were places where antisocial Europeans were shipped to, that very often they were asked to leave Europe on their own. If they were promised, and much of the so-called New World was settled in that way, that the monarchs of these various countries said, if you will leave here, if you will leave England, if you will leave France, we will let you go to the colonies, and you can go over there, and you can live like kings, and you can run everything. And so very often you had the people who could not get along with their own people in Europe who came to America on ships provided by the monarchies of their uh, European countries and came over here and threw their weight around and tried to act as though they were royalty uh, in Europe when in fact they were in, in fact the, uh, the trash of the earth, uh, the scum of the earth. So you had a penal colony in Louisiana. And then you had Africans who had come to America under their, their own strength, and that's important too. 
that we need to understand that not every African who was in America was in America because that African was brought to America in chains. Africans are known to be superb navigators. I'm told that there is a current that comes off the west coast of Africa that if you put something in there that floats, you will just float to the east coast of America. You didn't have to really know a lot about navigation, but we are known for our, our skill in that area. So Africans had been coming to what the so-called Native Americans called Turtle Island. They had been coming here. They had been trading. They had been leaving cultural artifacts. They had been leaving plants. They had been leaving uh, language here among the people who call themselves the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Blackfeet, the Algonquin, people who did not call themselves Native, Native Americans, but call themselves by their natural names. Africans were here. Sometimes they stayed and intermarried. Sometimes they went back home. Most often they went back home. But that is probably the reason that when Africans decided to run away from the plantations, where they were later brought to as captives, that they knew where to run to because they had already been here for many, many years and knew the terrain and knew where the friendly um, so-called Native Americans were, were living. So it's very important for us to know that history so that we will know that the Africans who were in New Orleans were Africans with a rich culture and who founded a culture and who did a great deal of building the physical community that became the city of New Orleans. So I think that just to, to set that record straight is, is very important, but we really do also want to get to the human beings, the African human beings whose lives were lost because of incompetence, because of negligence, because of sins of omission, and perhaps sins of commission. And we need to mourn that. You know, it's, it's not enough to have a day of prayer. We need a grieving process because we need to recognize that we have lost a great many souls that we may never know the number of souls that were lost, that we, were, that we have lost a huge part of ourselves, and that no one can just cast that aside and start talking about rebuilding a city. We've got to talk about rebuilding people. Uh, I'd like to further uh, speak on this subject of um because I, I, I had an opportunity this morning, and I uh, see a lot of the churches, you know, you turn your TV on, you see a lot of the ministers who are preaching about uh, catastrophes and what role God plays in these catastrophes, and each one has their own uh, uh, rendition of the role of God in all of these endeavors. But uh, we would like to look at it and see that we have seen people suffering. And, of course, it has affected a great deal of um, us here in America because, as they've said, there's never been a catastrophe in this country equal to what uh, this Hurricane Katrina has done. And then again, we have the technology, where is that um, the TV cameras were there rolling as Katrina was doing her thing. And so this brings the aspect of suffering and nature and catastrophe right into our living rooms. Uh, when it happens in uh, overseas or in another country, in Africa, in Asia, and Bangladesh, I mean, we look at it as it's possibly this is happening to other people, and so it doesn't affect us the same way as it does when this is an American city, as Professor Peace and Professor Levy have said, with a historical background in which if we have any histor history in our, in our roots, we'll find that uh, uh, New Orleans was a city, and I'm speaking, I'm saying was, you know, 
was a city that was significant to this American uh, continent, this American culture. And so therefore it brings it home to us that catastrophe is nothing foreign. It just hasn't happened to this extent in our lifetimes or on our shores. But when it does happen, it shows that we are just as vulnerable as those people in Africa, those people in Asia, the Middle East, and everywhere else. Well, why is that so? Well, we're all human beings. We're all human beings, and once something happens to us this great nature, as this catastrophe has, it makes us think. It makes us wonder, am I secure? Who can protect me? In this particular catastrophe, we were able to see that the government, which is our federal government, our state government, and our municipal government, were all incapacitated. You may call it incompetence. You may call it uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, red tape, whatever it was. But they were not able to respond appropriately, and they're still not responding three weeks later. So what is this? It shows that there's a problem. And this is not just a problem in this country. This is a problem throughout the whole world. Of course, the scientists are able to take a, 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 a rocket ship and send it to the moon and, 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 and gravitate, I mean, and, and rotate around Saturn and Mars. But we find it difficult to get people off roofs that are suffering. It's a difference between a scientist and a politician. We must understand that. Politicians does or do what is expedient because he's trying to balance all the different factors of society. And then again, he's trying to get reelected also. And then again, the type of people that we elect to these offices, they don't necessarily have the best interest of the people in mind. We have to understand that. They don't always have the best interests of the people in whom they're supposed to, and I, and, I, and I put that forth, supposed to represent, have their better interests in mind. The majority of politicians are put into office by special interest groups. We must understand that. We must educate ourselves if we want to get a better grasp of what has happened in New Orleans. It was a known factor among the scientific community and it had been exposed to the politicians and the bureaucrats that, well, that New Orleans is like a soup bowl with water all around it from the Mississippi to Lake Pontchartrain and that if a hurricane of this nature of this magnitude was to hit it was inevitable that it would go underwater but due to a lackadaisical attitude, a funding, a just disinterest, whatever you may want to call it, they did not heed this particular warning, you see. This is, these are the questions we need to ask. Why? Why did they not pay attention to the problems that was inevitably to come? Well, this is just one example. There are many other examples we are not paying attention to. As I stated earlier, global warming, it is a known fact among the scientific community that Antarctica and the frozen uh, uh, ice, icebergs and, and um, the frozen uh, 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 continent is thawing at an extraordinarily rate. And what does this mean? Well, there's a domino effect. If they are thawing at an extraordinary rate, then the ocean is going to rise. But we don't, I mean, we have to understand this. Well, if the ocean rises, then what happens? Well, if the oceans rise, there's going to be more flooding. If there's a warming of the, of the climate, of the temperature in the oceans, uh, in relationship, to other factors, hurricanes are more prominent. 
They don't usually follow their original routes. I mean, there are many that information and data is out there available all the time. But I don't want to get into all of the scientific, you know, uh, 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 jargon and the political jargon of what is this and what is it. This has been going on since time immemorial. The problems of human beings and the interests of human beings and who has our interests at heart and who doesn't have our interests at heart. But there come a time when we as individuals must take our responsibility unto our own selves. If we've given the responsibility over someone who's not taking our interests uh, in mind, we have to take it back. We have to take it back. We have put in a culture of politicians, and I'm saying the majority, politicians in this country that are not responsive to us as citizens. And we have to take the responsibility to, to, to take that power back and represent ourselves if we have to, elect my neighbor or elect someone else who has an interest in the common man. You see? Because once you set up a, a class of individuals, they become inoculated against the suffering of people, common people. They don't know what the price of bread is. They don't know what a quarter milk or a gallon of milk costs. Why? Because they are not subjected to it. They don't know what it costs to ride on a bus. They don't know what it is to work. I think there was uh, one of the uh, heads of the uh, Democratic Party, uh, uh, Dean, he said that most of these, and I quote, Republicans have never done an honest day's work in their lives. Well, probably the Democrats too. I wouldn't say just Republicans. He spoke it because he's a Democrat. But it's both of them. They probably haven't done an honest day's work in both of their lives because they don't have to. You see, we have set them up as this new aristocracy. The same thing that the Europeans were trying to escape in Europe has been set up here. This aristocracy. But we don't see it because we've come up with it or come up underneath it. And it takes sometimes drastic action to rid ourselves of these overlords who have set themselves up in the office and they've set up systems that support themselves continuously. They get a, they've made a, 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 a career, 30 years. Can you imagine 30, 40 years off of the public payroll? And become millionaires? 99% of all the, the senators on the Senate are millionaires. And many congressmen are millionaires. They put in judges that will legislate the way they want to legislate. They're represented by corporate interests. You see? But we go along with it. And then you have to choose between twiddly D and twiddly do. A twiddly dumb, as they say. Which is really no choice. Republican or Democrat. They all belong to the same club. They only fight in front of us. But behind closed doors, these are buddies. You see? They're getting us. They're ripping us off. But we continue on to, to believe that they will come to our aid. No. We have to take this responsibility back. We have to take the power back to the people. It is our constitutional right. It is our constitutional duty to do so. And until we do that, what else can you expect? They don't know you. They don't have the same feeling for you because they can't. At a particular point in time, when you inoculate yourself against the people, or away from the people, you can't know what the people really want. You can't know what they feel. Because you become hardwired. You put around yourself people who are just like you. And have been in the company of people just like you, you believe in a lot of stereotypes. Maybe they, they felt that if New Orleans uh, flooded, maybe they felt that, well, these people will get out anyway. 
Why not? They got buses. They can get out. School bus. Why don't they take a school bus? I'll go down to the Astrodome, uh, or the Superdome, excuse me. So they, all of these concoctions and conjectures, these are all intellectual conjecture without really knowing the severity of the situation because we do not experience this on a day-to-day -day basis. We do not acknowledge that there's poverty in this country. You see, We do not acknowledge that, well, you, he doesn't have a car, he can't drive out of the city. What are, what are you talking about? I got three cars. What are you talking about? He can't get out. There are poor people in this country. Lots of poor people. And the majority of poor people in this country, by no means, are all black. The majority of poor people in this country are white European. Let me tell you that. But they are so scattered out. And they have bought into this Americana, European belief in the aristocracy that they are finding out that this aristocracy, this elitism, neither cares about the blacks, as Kanye West says, nor the whites. It cares for neither one. You see? So people are going to have to realize that these people do not represent your interests. I know this talk may be falling on veil ears at this time. But turn on your television. The ones who are in Mississippi, they know what I'm talking about. There are people here today, three weeks later. They're not, just, they're not just blacks. These are whites in Mississippi who have not seen FEMA. They have not seen anything come of the, of the, of the federal government. And they're suffering too. But they have to realize, unless they get off of this thing of uh, skin privilege, that there will be the carnage, the sacrificial lambs for these individuals in whom they elect to office to represent them that has no interest in them whatsoever. But I'd like to move on a little further to the another realm of this endeavor, which is security. As we can see, there is no security, truly. There's no security in this world. The security that we're looking for in this world does not exist. It is hidden home here in America. People all over the rest of the world, they know this. There's no security. Where is the real security? The real security, you must seek it elsewhere. And I always tell and reiterate, that comes from within. We are subjected to suffering because this is a world of suffering. Oh, yes. There are a lot of people who are having a heavenly time here. But even those people eventually wind up in some form of suffering of some sort. It's twofold. Hell and heaven existing simultaneously together. Sometimes we have our foot in hell, sometimes we have it in heaven. You see? Nobody is independent of it. No one. We all like to think so that we are, but we are not. And eventually, the equalizer, the true equal rights, claims us all, and that is death itself. Death will claim us all. And there's no place that rich people can go that poor people can't go. You see what I'm saying? That is the equality of death. Whatever you may think, because you have two Mercedes, or you live in the White House, or you live in the, uh, the mansion, or you, it, that doesn't help. This is a great opportunity for people of great means to show their humanity, you see. They have to show their humanity if they want to be saved from their own uh, grappling and, and greed of materiality. Because none of this can you take with you at the time of death. I would like to turn this back over to Urumaji. Well, thank you for that extended um, version of the truth because we need to hear the truth as often as we can 
And the whole time that you were talking, I was thinking not only about what you were saying, but about things related to what you were saying. Um, I want to give Ben Levy an opportunity to respond because I could see him moving and I know he was moved. Thank you very much, Dr. Peace. Uh, yeah, Dr. Price, that was on time. I was, my mind was racing over here thinking about things. Uh, uh, everything from uh, what Dr. Peace talked about early on about the currents. It's, so it's, it's well known. Uh, Ivan Van Sertima wrote in his book, uh, They Came Before Columbus, about the currents that flow between f from, from West Africa across to the Caribbean uh, that you could just float on and take you right over here. And uh, he talked about the Africans who had traveled here uh, in the 14th century and uh, whose remains uh, exist in the uh, uh, in uh, Tabasco and Levanta and Veracruz and Mexico, the people that they were known as the Olmec people who preceded the Mayans. Um, I, I thought about what Dr. Price said about, uh, uh, about the government. Well, we, we seem to overlook in this country, uh, most people who read the Constitution and study it for the, the public law, uh, 192, I think it is, you have to pass before you get out of grammar school and high school. Uh, but very few of them fail to read that uh, and understand what it says in e even the Bill of Rights or, or what it says that we hold these truths to be self-evident. And it's important that it's self-evident. Nobody has to explain it. It's supposed to be real clear that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, it seems that the people who like to talk a lot about what the founding fathers, uh, or what I like to prefer to call, refer to refer to as the founding European fathers, came up with, and not fail to follow that in a true sense. They seem to be, in, in, as we can see in the case of New Orleans, stuck on Article One, Section Two of the United States Constitution, which is the Commerce Clause, which regulates commerce with the Indians and three fifths of all others. Or well, the three-fifths clause that's in there is really something we have to understand because what it meant was that when you had uh, slaves on the plantation, the plantation owner could count his slaves as three-fifths of an individual, and they gave that particular person more voting power, but the slaves themselves couldn't vote. We're seeing in the, in the displacement of uh, the, 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 the people who are, we're talking about approximately 400,000 people who have been displaced out of New Orleans as far away as Oregon, uh, Washington State, uh, uh, here in Illinois, Maine, Rhode Island. I mean, places where, where basically the, the, the culture of African Americans almost is non-existent. And, uh, and and expecting them to be able to live there, and, and of course there are many horror stories that that uh, have been brought out that I don't want to talk about because I can't verify these things. But w one thing is for certain is that while th and on the one hand uh, a hand is being extended to support of support and help, in another case a lot of hands are tied behind people's backs and they're not really trying to do anything. This is very much uh, if we if we could give a, a, a reasonable parallel. When African Americans were taken from Africa, sometimes the families were split up. The children were separated from the from the parent from the mothers. The, the 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 men were separated from their women. Women separated from their men, and in some cases they never got together. And in cases where they could get together, then some apparatus was put in place to separate them. But we're seeing the very same, uh, or at least a very similar thing, occurring right now today in New Orleans and the unfortunate part of it is that we don't want to acknowledge that this is what's going on because the ultimate end of this we we there are lots of children out there who don't know where their parents are and the parents don't know where their children are uh, and, and this is a very similar thing that occurred in the cases where we saw in New Orleans where the people could come together because they had similar backgrounds or in the Caribbean where they had similar backgrounds or even here in uh, South Carolina and the Virginias and other places in the Sea Islands off of Georgia where they could come together there was an attempt to break them up so that they couldn't maintain their cultural base and I think that that's something that uh, 
that we have to keep in mind because it wasn't until 1719 that the first slave ships even came to Louisiana. And in most cases, those uh, many of people who came off the slave ships, they weren't slaves uh, in the ca classical sense of chattel. Many of them were basically indentured servants. I was listening to what uh, Dr. Price was saying about the number of, of Europeans who are also suffering in this. Well, and, and how they have mis uh, been in some cases misguided in believing that they're a part of this uh, aristocracy or this oligarchy that they have in this country. Well, a lot of that goes back to uh, the 17th century during Bacon's Rebellion. Because in Bacon's Rebellion, you had a class rebellion against the upper class or the planter class versus the people who were generally the, all the people, the Africans, because that's what they were called. They were Africans. They weren't called blacks or black Americans, African Americans. They were called Africans. And you had the poor Europeans who were French. And, and Irish and British and so forth, and that's what they were known by. They were known by their nations. And then you had the various peoples of the native, from, uh, native so called Native American nations, the, the Iroquois and, and so forth, who were all basically together as one group. There was no distinction going on. But what happened when the planters found out that the, the, that the Africans, the, the, the Native American nations, and the various people, the European nations who were poor, were going to come together to revolt against them. What they did was they had a meeting and they convinced the, the, the poor Europeans of the, uh, the, 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 the Irish and the French and the British and so forth to uh, that they would, what they did was they gave them certain rights. They gave them a horse, which was a very valuable thing at the time. It's like somebody today would give you a car. They gave them little patches of land where they could go and they could uh, plant food. And they gave them certain privileges like carrying a gun that made you feel more like you were close to the planters in terms of your status in society. And so by this definition, they produced a group of people that have come to be known as whites. And they convinced them that they were distinct from the Africans and the Native Americans. And that consequently created a situation in which the poor whites thought that they were better than the, the other poor people who were amongst them, the Native Americans and the Africans, so that they made that distinction amongst them, and they, then they began to criminalize the Native Americans and the Africans. The consequences of that were that then you had a group of people in this country who felt that they were as good as the elite planter uh, class when they really weren't, but they were given the impression that they were. And unfortunately, when tragedy strikes and they realize that they are in the same boat with everybody else, then all of a sudden some of that whole thing breaks down. And, we, we're, and we're seeing more and more here in this country the, 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 the significance and the impact of the, of the nature of this class struggle that's going on in this country and that will probably continue to go on because we here we face a situation where the United States of America is constantly having to borrow from other nations something that has never happened in all the annals of the history of the United States of America is that they have to borrow money from other nations in order to shore up the national debt which and when you, when you have to borrow money from other nations who have money, that means that your country is broke. <coughs> the country is broke. The, the war in Iraq has broke the country. This process here with the rebuilding of New Orleans and the ultimate aftermath of Katrina, they're talking about somewhere up in $100 billion. That's going to have to be paid for for maybe two or three generations. That... Uh, that the implications of which are going to be vast. There, there, there are one of the other significant parts of this that most people don't think about. Uh, Hunter Adams was on the program once before, and he was talking about post-traumatic slave syndrome. The implication of people who are suffering psychologically from the impact of slavery. Well, now we're talking about people who are going to suffer psychologically from the impact of this particular uh, natural disaster that has occurred. And we haven't even began to see the psychological implications of this. We haven't began to see the suffering, the depression, um, uh, uh, what they call bipolar disease, what they call schizophrenia. Y'all used to all basically say all African Americans were schizophrenic anyway because we had two d dual personalities. So all of these things are going to be occurring over the long run that no one is able to really approach and deal with until we come to grips with the fact that this is a major issue and that we have to settle on finding a, 
solution and the solution lies within ourselves it's beautiful that people are coming forward it's beautiful that people are coming stepping up to help it's beautiful to see that the african-american community in the united states is standing up and becoming one about this particular issue which shows that our people can do things it's beautiful to see the resilience of our people in terms of the, the importance of this but what we have to do is we have to sustain that as Dr. Dr. Price has said, we got to look at look now at what's really going on with all these people who've been elected and see what it is that and, and we're seeing what they're really all about. And we have to begin to decide how we want to approach this. This is a uh, a call for uh, not only analysis, but also a call for change. Because change is time, it's time for change, and that change is necessary. Because in New Orleans, that I used to go and visit all the time, and I loved to go and and uh, and hang around in and and visit the bookstores, which is what I love to do. I'm not one to go down there and drink, but I like to go down and visit the bookstores and look at the culture and and the history and the historical aspects of it. That New Orleans is gone, gone forever, because the what what made New Orleans New Orleans was not the city but the people that were in it. That was what gave it the flavor, the gumbo that it had. That was its, its, its real roots, was in its people and in the beauty of the people and the niceness and the kindness of the people and so forth. And, and to, to get away from the, 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 the perception of the criminalization of the, of the, of the people as, uh, you know, they showed shown this, this one uh, particular slide of the whites who were going into the store and they said that they were finding food and then they had the picture of the blacks. They said that they were looting. And so anytime they referred to looters, they were all blacks. And I saw one thing on CNN where there was a little old white lady. She was in the store. She Her home wasn't flooded or nothing like that. But she had come to the store because there was free food. And she went in there to get free food. And she went and got some flowers. And she asked the National Guardsman, oh, do you think I should take the flowers back? And he was like, no, ma'am, I don't think nobody's going to get you for uh, taking the flowers out. But the question is, was she looting? Or was she just getting free food? Did she even necessarily need the food is a big question. But she was never considered to be a looter. No one talked about arresting her or anything. There's a young man had the case uh, who, who uh, commandeered a bus that was on the, on the lot, a school bus. Didn't even know how to drive a stick. Figured out how to drive a stick. Got the bus. Got a bunch of people and drove all the way to Houston with these people who pitched their money together to pay for gas and everything, and now they're saying that they want to prosecute the young man for stealing the bus. That's insanity. You know, that, that's, ins that's the type of insanity that we have to look at when people are merely surviving. They, and these weren't just, you know, blacks he had on the bus. He had whites. He had anybody who wanted to get a lift. He got them and said, get on this bus. He said the bus, bus was packed. You had babies, old people. Uh, young people, everybody was on that bus, and the, his whole thing is, this is something that I can do. That took a lot of courage for that young man to do that and to commandeer that bus and get all those people to safety, because that's what he did. That was a hero act. That wasn't a criminal act. Anybody else would, if it had probably been somebody else, they would have said, oh, he did a great, wonderful, heroic thing. Well, you know, in this case, what he did was, that young man did was a heroic thing, but because he's an African-American, now they're talking about prosecuting him and locking him up. And in Texas, Texas is not the most friendly place for African-Americans because just this past week, they executed their first female. So that uh, these are things that we have to look at, and we have to consider the importance of this particular event as a wake-up call to our awareness. You know, uh, you, uh, the last poets once said a long time ago that the revolution would not be televised. And here we see a situation where it is being televised and we're seeing the, the, the response of the people and how beautiful it is. But now the people have to ask themselves after this, now what? Because just as quickly as that had occurred, they jumped from that right to the Judge Roberts confirmation hearings like Katrina never happened. And that's a whole other story all into itself about this new Judge Roberts who's going to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court with all those old men over there get a young guy 50 years old to be their boss. And the implications for the, the, implication for the decisions that he is going to make on the court are going to be so vast over time that uh, we can't even begin to imagine what is, going to, what is going to happen. But every now and then in this country, approximately every 20 years or so, we have what might be called an uprising 
uh, uh, that, that creates a certain revelation for us. Uh, going back as far as uh, 1918 and the and 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 the and the riots and so forth and that took place between 1918 and uh, and, and 1920, especially the one in 1919 and so forth. These things have happened, and so now we have another one. But this time it's happened because of a natural disaster, and we have to now become aware of what we're going to do, how we're going to approach this, and uh, what steps we're going to take to make some positive change out there for the betterment of our people from here until uh, this thing is no more. Thank you. You know, it's, it's so wonderful to hear you cover so much of what needs to be covered because this is a major, it's a global, as Dr. Price has pointed out, issue it is mu much more than the non-issues that we have heard over the past couple of weeks as, you know, having people referred to as refugees. And it certainly makes me wonder if refugees are people who are escaping genocide, was the federal government calling them like they see them? Was there an act of genocide involved in this Hurricane Katrina? But certainly to have them called out of their names, to have them disrespected to the extent that they were allowed to suffer endlessly while everyone stood by as though they were helpless, as you pointed out, people who seemed to have their hands tied behind them, their backs. We need what Marcus Garvey gave us which was an awareness of ourselves as a nation. We need what Marcus Garvey suggested, which was a, an organization that was specifically organized to meet our needs and represent our interests. Because Dr. Price has pointed out that the politicians are not necessarily representative of the interests of people with whom they share no interests. So it's kind of hard to expect a millionaire to understand how it is to have your money run out before the month runs out. It's very difficult to expect somebody to represent your interests who does not share them, someone to understand your culture who has no familiarity with it. So obviously, and this, this has nothing to do with racism. This has something, everything to do with survival. We have seen this time, as we have seen so many times before, that what Jesse Jackson has said, no one is going to save us but us. And so if we had, for example, the Black Cross nurses, had we had an organization with the authority to act on our behalf rather than having to go through middleman, there's one organization that required that you have a training class with them before you could volunteer to help your own people. There, are, there were organizations who required you to sign a list if you wanted to be a volunteer and then never called you from the list that they made. There were, I have seen places where there were stockpiles of clothing and other kinds of goods that were donated for the victims of the Hurricane Katrina. But they were not distributed. They were just there, you know, waiting for someone to figure out what to do with them. And certainly there were people who did not understand the culture of the people whom they were attempting to service. So they didn't know, for example, to ask them what they needed. I think that what we need is, for our, pr to, pr is to pretend that our politicians can represent us and have a duty to do so. We ought to want to know where every single person who is missing is. We ought to want to know what is the extent of the damage. We can't just allow our people to be presumed dead if they are missing and no one can account for them. We cannot just allow uh, uh, these questions that we have about the breach that appeared in the levee that did not seem to be storm related. We cannot allow that question of why we had more than 
a hurricane in New Orleans. We must have answers. Our politicians must be requested, demanded in fact, to have congressional hearings around this to find who was at fault, who was negligent, who failed to perform duties for which they were paid. We need to find out what happened so that it cannot be repeated. In the meantime, we need to organize ourselves so that we can take care of each other because we know that it is our duty to take care of ourselves and to take care of each other. And we must do it directly and not through middlemen who may or may not pass on the things that we are trying to give to each other. A middle person cannot pass my love to my brother or my sister. I must be able to embrace my brother and my sister. And so we must insist that we have access to information and that we have access to our people who are suffering. And this is for all people who are suffering, all human beings, all brothers and all sisters. We have an obligation to see to it that our efforts are not made in vain, that we didn't just pour out all of this generosity and all of this kindness onto a desert where it will bear no fruit. We must insist that our politicians do what they are elected to do, what we thought we were electing them to do, or otherwise I would think that Dr. Price has got to be right that if our politicians are not going to represent our interests, if they are not going to be there for us when they are needed, then we need to change the guard. Because certainly, as someone said on a recent television show, the soldiers are great, but the generals are crummy. Hotep. <laughs>